ಯುಗೇನ ಚಿತ್ತ ಪದೇನ ವಾಚಾ ಮಲ ಶರೀರ ವೈದ್ಯಕೇನ ಯೋಪಾಕರೋತ್ತ ಪ್ರವರ ಮುನೀನಾ ಪಾತಂಜಲಿ ಪ್ರಾಂಜಲೀರಾನತೋಸ್ಮಿ ಐ ಪ್ರಾಸ್ಟ್ರೇಟ್ ವಿತ್ ಫೋಲ್ಡೆಡ್ ಹ್ಯಾಂಡ್ಸ್ ಬಿಫೋರ್ ಪತಂಜಲಿ who benefited mankind by delivering yoga for mind grammar for speech and by removing impurities of the body through medicine so in the last class we were studying the 35th and the 36th sutra of the second chapter of patanjali yoga sutra as we have already seen that after enunciating the eight fold paths of yoga starting with yama niyama which has to be followed by the asana pranayama pratyahara dharana dhyana samadhi so we studied the first two the yama and the niyama what are the various practices of yama the restraints and niyama the observances we have studied and in the last class we started studying the results that ensues because by getting established in the practices of yama and niyama that if you get established there are some signs there are some manifestation to which you know that you have got established on in those practices and that's the thing which will be enunciated gradually in the succeeding sutras in the 35th and the 36th sutra we found that it was enunciated in the last class we saw that what was enunciated what was described that if one gets established in ahimsa the non violence what's the result it's just like a science that this if you practice this this is going to be the result and it can be invariably proven in our life it has already been proven by innumerable sadhakas and yogis in their life in the past and it can be uh proven it can be proven even in the future even in the present even in the future these are something like universal truths so what's the 35th sutra what it spoke that what happens when you get established in ahimsa so last class we studied ahimsa pratishthayam tat sannidho vairatyagah if a yogi gets established in non injury all beings coming near him cease to be hostile so that's the thing we studied in the last class that ahimsa pratishthayam tat sannidho vairatyagah so we were giving the example you know nowadays we find the mobile phone jammers are there that in some place when some conference is going on some meeting is going on and suddenly the mobile may ring in spite of the instruction that they let keep the mobile silent or off we find sometimes some people forget and the mobile may ring in the middle of the meeting and that will disturb the meeting so what's done nowadays there are some mobile jammers so to make to ensure that when the meeting is going on that no mobile should ring the mobiles are as if jammed their their connection this the mobile signals are cut off for the time being are disabled for the time being in the vicinity where the meeting is going on the mind of a yogi who is established in non injury in thought words and deeds not only physical acts even in thought there is no malice there is no sense of hatred jealousy feeling of rancor all those negative feeling which speaks of hatred towards other that also is a type of violence and injury i have gone read i have got read of all those negative emotions then i get established in the practice of non violence 
and immediately you will find that in your presence in your vicinity there cannot be any violence even if the so called the carnivores the lion the tiger as we were discussing in the last class they by their nature those animals by their nature are this uh, uh him they they, they are uh, cruel because that's how they sustain themselves they have to feed on the non vegetarian food they have to feed on their prey they have to kill the prey but even those animals when they are in the vicinity of such holy person who has got established in non violence for the time being you will find that they cannot think of violence even if the prey is brought in the presence in the, in the just in front of their mouth you will find they for the time being are totally this what is a calm they in no way are resorting to killing other animals resorting to killing resorting to injury of other animals how is it possible that the mind of the yogi that influence of the yogi's mind this minds are all interconnected we don't have the segregate minds that the one who has got established in ahimsa his mind immediately we find in a very nice in a, uh, in a wonderful way is creating a place is a vicinity of non violence so that's why we find it has been described in the olden days in the vicinity of the ashramas the ashramas were in the deep inside the jungle the monks used to stay there there was no fear of being attacked by the lion they were safe and even in their vicinity others were also safe so that's something which is a proven fact and that was being described in the 35th sutra that ahimsa pratishthayam tat sannidhau vairatyaga so then then the 36th sutra that also we studied the satya if one gets established in truthfulness that even that uh, what to speak of just in speech even in mind they in no way think of uh, something which is contrary to what they are speaking generally what happens that we don't express our mind there may be so many things going on in our mind but when i am presenting myself to others i always make it a point that i should be prove i should prove myself to be a civilized being if i really speak out my mind if you all speak out of my our mind we will be considered as lunatic the only difference between is the so called mad person and the so called a normal person is that the mad person doesn't know the so called lunatic doesn't somehow has lost that sense whatever is going on in the mind it starts speaking we that have that sensibility that all those things need not be spoken when i am presenting myself to the other i have to prove myself to be a person who has benefactance i am a beneficial and an effective member of the society that's how we are all the propaganda machines our mind is such but for the one who has lost the his wits he forgets that propriety that sense of propriety he just speaks out his mind and we say he's mad actually there's not much difference so sri ramakrishna says that who is established in satya the one that not a single thought in his mind is something which he cannot speak out his mind and his speech always confirms he there is no need to hide anything he can speak out whatever is going on in his mind such a person is established in truth so now we have to think that we may say we may feel that i never speak lie then this sutra should be applicable to me it's not that easy when my mind has become so pure that not a single thought arises which i feel i have to hide it i can just speak out my mind any time so monmukh ak 
the mind and the speech should conform that doesn't mean that whatever is in my mind i should speak out it just means the opposite that whatever the way i produce myself to the society the way i present myself to the society my mind should be gradually cleansed to conform to my speech and when it happens you get established in truth and when you get established in truth what happens such a person such a yogi in the 36 sutra it was mentioned satya pratishthayam kriya phalam asrayatvam means you need not have to act on your thoughts just you think it happens that's why we go to a holy person and ask for his blessings why that at the beginning it is we who follow the truth and when you get established in truth the truth follows you whatever you say is bound to happen why we go to the holy person even if he is not speaking he is just silent we go and try to be in his presence and try to please him what's the idea that such an holy person is established in truth even once being pleased by my humility if he says be blessed may if he says that be virtuous i will find my personality has started overhauling my really my mind is getting purified i am evolving spiritually their words are ineffable so that's why the tradition is there that go to the holy person try to please him through seva why whatever he pleases whatever he uh, wishes that is bound to come true so that's why it has been mentioned that kriya phala asratyam that he whatever he speaks out that is bound to happen so he is satya sankalpa that not a single resolution he takes that can, that is not going to be materialized each and every resolution of his is to be is bound to be materialized so that what happens when one gets established in satya so now we will proceed with what are the manifestations in what way we find the manifestations in our character that what all traits we develop when we get established in other other practices of yama and niyama so the next practice is the practice of asteya the non stealing so that's what if you get established in it so what's the out what is the result that has been spoken of in the 37 sutra so what's the 37 sutra speaking of asteya pratishthayam sarva ratna upasthanam asteya pratishthayam when non stealing is established pratishtha means to get established asteya means non stealing when you get established in non stealing then what what happens sarva ratna upasthanam all the jewels present themselves wealth comes to you you do not have to reach out go out in endeavor of wealth wealth comes to you and that wealth doesn't mean only the so called the monetary wealth wealth here with jewel means sentient sentient as well as insentient even among the human beings those who are the best among the human beings best among the human being as per their character is concerned as per their skills are concerned you will find such persons are coming uh in your vicinity not only in vicinity they are coming in your close contact so your contact details becomes those persons those who are quite influential so they are the jewels of the society and not only that even the wealth starts pouring in what happens actually even in your day to it is not something which speaks of some miraculous thing you know day to day life we find what that if i feel like donating some money for some uh uh what you say some uh charitable uh act for some charities i want to donate some money i will of course make it sure that the organization through which i am going to 
do some charitable act act i myself may not be doing i have some money i want to donate it of course you will be in search of such an organization which is not fake you know that they are established in truth whatever money they take they use it for the proper purpose so it is not something which they are speaking which speaks of some miracle so if you get established in a stair so that the look of indifference that i am in no way going to get some uh, selfish interest out of it so when the people get convinced about that the wealth pours in not only that even when you are going to contribute to the society by joining some organization all our jobs which we are doing is a type of service there also we find what that when i am i am just going to be employed i am in search of some job of course i will search the organization which is not fake i know that organization is something which is an established organization they are working for the real benefit of mankind in whatever way it may be i will go and join there so all the so called the assets of the society will be in search of such organization so that's the thing which speaks of astaya pratishtayam sarva ratna upasthanam in secular sense and if it is one is spiritually established so in the scripture they speak of ajagara vritti a real yogi need not even have to move out for bhiksha just the way a python just lies in one place the prey comes to it it is so nicely camouflaged sometimes the prey is totally unaware it comes in its vicinity and it comes as if in the mouth of the predator so that is called ajagara vritti the python need not have to move the prey come to its mouth so they say the one who is established in astaya he can also that uh, get est- that, that uh, practice the ajagara vritti in their life there are two types of vritti one is madhukara vritti and other is the ajagara vritti what who is the madhukar that yes that for my own sustenance i have to beg so i move out what is the madhukari means but i don't beg from one person why if every day i depend on a particular person i somehow become dependent on him his character his nature starts influencing me his expectations are there because he is every day feeding me so what i do i go I just go for begging minimum 3 houses i should go and maximum five houses that's the practice in the old tradition why three houses that i shouldn't take that the entire quantity from one house just a little when giving a little food the the third person uh, won't have any expectation from you it is something very nominal he has provided you so there won't be any expectation so that way from home to home minimum three houses you should go so that not a single householder is burdened and at the same time you shouldn't go on begging throughout the day it may so happen that you get nothing even after going to four to five houses that day you should know that god has uh, uh, meant that for you for that day so you have to be satisfied whatever you get by going to the maximum five houses if it is not sufficient you have to be satisfied by that so that was the idea of madhukar when while practicing this when you get established when there is no chauriya vritti in any way stealing even what you say that in in any way that in the when we were discussing the sutra we told that even to get established in astaya first you have to get established in ahimsa why it is not that the others wealth which uh, steal we hurt others by our word and that way we steal others happiness so actually if we get established in ahimsa we get established in all the practices so by hurting others we steal others happiness we steal others time so practicing satya is not easy when non stealing is not that easy 
when i have really got established in ahimsa then only i can get established in asteya and when i have got established that's what we find that the so called spiritual person who is totally dependent on god the wealth just comes to him whatever is needed for his sustenance not only that even after they have passed away in their name the organization which is running the all whatever wealth comes for all sorts of work is because of that name because because of just of that name so that's the thing which is being mentioned just see this ramakrishna organization that it it's in no way we can say it is our uh, that all the monastic members labor work their skill their efficiency that actually uh, entails whatever fund we get nowhere there is so it has it may so happen that one swami who is a really very inter- intelligent person very skilled person most probably delivers wonderful lectures is very is very good in administration for some reason goes out of the order that name ramakrishna is no more with him there are so many instances we find that in no way he is influential anymore it was just that name that actually is enabled that's the power that we know that ramakrishna was totally established in that asteya had no sense of expectation from anyone totally dependent on god and the wealth not only in his lifetime just to sustain him it still continues so that's what is being indicated that asteya pratishthayam sarvaratna vasthanam in the life of ramakrishna we find that he saw in vision that the three and half the sponsors the rasaddars will be there to take care of his day to day needs not only his day to day needs even when the devotees will start coming that large family there will be this rasaddars the sponsors to take care and they came and not only that be like mathur mohan shambhu charan mitra that one by one we find balaram so many are there to take care of sri ramakrishna's large family surendranath the one who was the one who purchased the first property for the ramakrishna mission so there were so many rasaddars so many sponsors for ramakrishna and not only that the biggest miracle of ramakrishna is the 16 there's all the disciples life we find that you know that there are so many uh, illuminaries in the spiritual world but after the passing away of the saint the lineage starts dwindling they don't get that lineage in the ramakrishna tradition we find that the jewels even in the form of beings not only just wealth like narendra nath swami brahmanand all the 16 of them are jewels the 16 monastic disciples not as means you will find that each and every their life of this their this lives are highly spiritually illumined souls they are all spiritually illumined in their own right so that way you find that even as the persons who are coming they are the jewels not only the wealth even the persons all the disciples of ramakrishna you find the jewel so that is that happens when you are established in this non stealing asteya when no shorts of expectation is there from the world you are totally dependent on god then only you get established in asteya and that's what when you get established that's the result which happens has been spoken of in the 37th sutra the 38th sutra speaks of what happens when you get established in brahmacharya continence brahmacharya pratishthayam virya labha so when you, you get established in continence you acquire virya now this world virya doesn't simply mean strength it's not physical strength which has been spoken of this virya actually speaks of in one sense medha what is the medha in our life you will find that the spiritual that intellectually we are we may be highly intellectual we may be highly intellectual we have the, all the knowledge of the scriptures but when the crisis come we find 
that all those knowledge is of no avail. At that time, they don't come to my mind. They are the not the thing which is guiding me. My mind gets totally clouded. I forget them again and again. The one who is established in this Brahmacharya, the Virya finds expression as Medha. They, they have the power to return the spiritual knowledge. In all situations of life, that is always there as the guiding principle. They never get deluded. They never forget it. And they have wonderful, you will find this memory in, in uh, every situation of life. Whatever the situation, immediately the spiritual knowledge, corresponding spiritual knowledge is always awakened in their mind. Sri Ramakrishna used to give a wonderful example that the ordinary mind is just like a mirror. Whatever is in its front, it reflects. But the moment the person moves out from the vicinity of the mirror, the reflection is gone. It's no more there. But the mind of the one who is established in Brahmacharya, who has the medha, his mind is just like the photographic plate. In the olden days, Sri Ramakrishna was the master of examples. When he, for the first time, he went for uh, having it, just taking a picture, taking a photo, the disciples took him for taking his photo. He saw in the olden days, you found that the photographic plates has to be inserted. And those photographic plates were actually, the glass was has to be uh, tainted uh, so that it can return whatever falls on it with particular chemicals, it has to be tainted. So seeing that Sri Ramakrishna immediately told, so this is the mind of one who has medha, the one who has established in Brahmacharya. In an ordinary mirror, whatever it is, is in its vicinity, it reflects. But the moment you go off away, the reflection is gone. But once you are in the vicinity of the photographic plate, it, even if you go out, it returns your image. You can develop from that the image which has, uh, which, of which it has taken the photograph. So the medha speaks of that. It retains the knowledge. Otherwise, our mind is just like the village pond full of scum, the green scum. Sri Ramakrishna, another example is giving that when, you know, in the, in the village, the villagers go to the pond to use the water. It is full, it is just covered with a green scum. What they do, they remove the scum, the transparent water becomes visible. Whatever they have to clean, they clean the vessels or whatever, they clean. And the moment they leave the pond, in no time, the scum comes back and covers the entire pond. Just for the time being, as long as the cleaning process was going on, that water was visible. And in no time, they leave the pond, immediately the scum comes and again covers the entire pond. So Ramakrishna is saying our mind is something like that. That again and again, we go on cleansing, it comes and again covers it. Why? It's because unless we get established in Brahmacharya, the continence, we can never return the spiritual wisdom. We will find in the time of need, it is not helping us. So this, in this sense, the word virya actually means medha. Not only that, sometimes you will find that a wonderful professor uh, with a tremendous intellectual knowledge, tremendous fund of knowledge, with tremendous control over the language, is delivering a wonderful lecture, but it doesn't impress us, the so-called the listeners. And even if it impresses, the moment the lecture is over, after some time, everyone forgets about it. Just after the applause, it's gone. If you ask, what have you heard? We cannot say. But when Ramakrishna speaks, that's something we find is very simple, but very profound. We never forget it. So this Brahmacharya doesn't speak of our own medha, even it influences the mind of others. So Virya is the power to return spiritual power and to instill that knowledge in the mind of his disciple. You can just make others convinced 
of the spiritual knowledge. So that special power comes when one gets established in Brahmacharya. A learned professor with his beautiful language may instruct, but it doesn't go deep. But Sri Ramakrishna, you will find that he's to stammer. He's to stammer. Here, here, and his the dialect he used was a very colloquial of the village. It was not the so-called university's language, not the academic language. It was the language, colloquial language. The dialect was a colloquial. But people were so highly impressed by it. Why? Because he's established in Brahmacharya. How Brahmacharya helps, it actually helps in the awakening of the Kundalini. Your nerve system becomes very strong. That's the strength. It's not the physical strength. It actually speaks of the strength of your nervous system. It's just to give an example. You know that when the electricity passes through the wire, if there is a surge of electricity, you know, if, if suddenly because of a surge of electricity, the electricity, the more the, there's a potential difference becomes very high, the voltage becomes very high. And if the wire is a very narrow wire, what will happen? It will get burnt out, isn't it? It doesn't have the capacity to transmit a very high voltage. It has a limitation. That's why we have the fuse to protect us from all those surges. And so our nerves are also like that. If we are practicing this meditation, trying to focus our mind, but at the same time, we are not established to certain extent in Brahmacharya. Our nerves are not strong. Unless one practices Brahmacharya, these nerves are not strong. This because of that, you have developed the faculty of focus with that. There is as if the tremendous nervous, through the nerve, this tremendous current is flowing, but the nerve doesn't have the capacity to transmit that current. And that's why there can, there, there's a chance of getting mentally deranged. So that's why they say that one who has adopted to the spiritual life, these are the practices which they have to take care of. If you are meditating for half an hour or one an hour, it's okay. But the one who has really thought of taking meditation as a way of life is going for an intense meditation. Unless one is established in these practices, it is going to harm them. And not only that, that how this virya actually enables in the awakening of the kundalini. Many of us, we find the discussions on kundalini it, and most of the time we have no very clear idea about it. What actually the rousing of the kundalini means. Now, one thing that when the nerve currents, when all for all, now just suppose I have to move the table. What is happening? The mind takes the resolution that I have to move the table. That resolution just immediately is transmitted through the motor nerves in the form of electric current. All the nerve current are like electric current. That comes and it immediately contracts that muscle. Suppose my hand muscles has to be contracted and then only I can push or pull the table. I have to contract the muscles. So it is a motor nerve current pumping through the motor nerves that contracts the muscles. That's why when you are uh, uh, to test the electric wire, live wire, they always use the other side, not the palm, the opposite side of the palm they use to check because in electric, when, the, when, the, when you get shock, immediately your muscle contracts. So the hand will immediately contract. If you are testing with this side, you will be holding the wire and that will be fatal. So it has to be always tested with this side. So even it is a live wire, the hands will contract, you will be thrown away from the wire. Why we are just saying that? That just to say that the nerve current is almost is similar to the electric current, but it is very, very feeble. This nerve is a very electric, feeble electricity. Now, when through the spiritual practice, when you practice continence, brahmacharya, and you are having more and more intense meditation, then one thing happens. What's the thing happens? Now, when there's, you will find that when the voltage is very high, there is no need for any medium. There's no need for any medium. Like when there's a thunderbolt, it's a tremendous high voltage. 
the thunderbolt from the sky forms an arc and touches the earth's surface without any wire the electricity is passing from the sky to the ground why because the voltage is terribly high extremely high similarly when through meditation and practice of brahmacharya you your nerves become sufficiently strong till now in medical science there is uh, they have found the, uh, that the shushumna the central canalis the spinal cord is something like an eight structure if you put eight one above the other that's what your spinal cord is like eight if you just put one up to, uh, one above the other that's each spine is like eight so through one of those the hollow of this eight when one you keep one above the other then two hollows are formed on one canal is for the sensory nerve the other for the motor nerves and in the center of the eight there is another small hole through which also one passage is there in science they say it has nothing to do with the nerves it is just to supply the nutrients the central canal is it is supply the nutrients to the spinal cord and the nerves but in yoga they say that that's the, the central canal is is actually the shushumna this they call this ira pingala the sensory and the motor nerves the ira and the pingala and this central canal is is the shushumna which has nothing to do for an ordinary person with the nervous current for a yogi when you your this the your uh, what is the power of contemplation has become so strong the central canal is open up just like the way in a cathode ray tube there is a vacuum because of the high voltage the cathode rays are passing from there's a, one electrode to the other electrode it is just passing without any so called as such wire so here also the central canal this canal is from that the your this nervous current start rising up and all the ganglions each of the ganglions of the chakras which these ganglions are actually the storehouse of your all experiences which you have had in the process of evolution just say bacteria what it does it only procreates and eats food nothing else it does so these are the experiences in an office you do what 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 we do the files uh, very old files we don't throw we keep it in the locker when we are working these old files are also there so these are very old files what are the old this this of having food procreate so that's why the lower chakras when you will find the shushumna is arising you have as activated them so they say first at the very beginning each all the yogi goes to the dark phase where the mind is extremely turbulent now when you rise up we developed emotion much later in the process of evolution so that's the center is in the heart when the kundalini goes there then you find that overwhelming this emotion is working in the form of devotion and the speech came much later if the emotions came even for the animals we find the emotions but for the human being the script the speech all these things that this, this uh, the your writing speaking all this came much later so for that the ganglion the chakra is still higher it's in the throat that's why they say this when it reaches there that uh, uh, that from the emotions that it finds expression as all our this uh, devotional literature you just try to express whatever you has realized so then then still higher it goes to the visualization in the agnya chakra and ultimately it goes to the sahasrara to take you to the highest spiritual liberation so how it is happening is the same nervous current when it is weak it can pass only through the nerves when you are strengthening it by the practice of continence not only that continence followed by meditation then the same nervous current needs no more needs the limitation of the nerves it starts rising through the shushumna taking you to the this various levels of experiences ultimately taking you to the highest spiritual realization so that actually this rising of the kundalini in another sense is the 
virya which has been spoken of so many think that just by practicing brahmacharya one becomes muscular very strong no this virya that's why we never translated the word virya literally there cannot be any translation it doesn't mean the physical strength it means actually the intellectual st- the strength of your nervous system followed by the strength of your this the spiritual strength which can take you to the highest spiritual realization so that has been spoken of as the this virya so brahmacharya pratishthayam virya labha so you have restrain that's it's like pruning the plant when you are pruning what you do the what the thing which you desire i desire the flower i desire the fruit so what i do the i that when the if the plant branches all the energy will be going to those branches leaves and all so i prune i cut them so that it all the all the nutrients are used to uh, uh, ripen the fruit to get better fruit better flower better uh, uh, what you say your vegetables whatever it may be for that we do the pruning so brahmacharya is something like that pruning all the lower parts is controlled so that this all the same energy is converted into something which helps us in our spiritual progress it actually strengthens the mind and by strengthening the mind it helps in awakening of the arousing of the kundalini and with that we go to the various layers of uh, experiences ultimately taking it us to the spiritual realization so that has been spoken of as the brahmacharya practice the establishment in the practice of brahmacharya the next is the practice of aparigraha non acceptance so if you get established then what happens aparigraha sthairya the 39th sutra is speaking aparigraha sthairya janma kathamata sambodha on attaining perfection in non acceptance and non expectation if i may i may not accept it but in my mind expectation is there constantly i am being uh, what you say that assailed by a lot of expectations then i can never be practi- the practicing in literal sense of parigraha i may be not asking anything uh, from anyone and even if someone is going to give me i may say no i don't want but in my mind i find thousands of ways expectations are there then you are not established when it has totally gone when it goes when you have totally surrendered to the divine knowing well the divine is there to take care of me in all situation and the total that surrender has come then you have got established in aparigraha then when you get really established in aparigraha what happens janma kathamata sambodh this the knowledge of the past and the future existences dawns you can just go back retrace your past and the memory of the past lives becomes vivid in your mind if you get established in non acceptance what's the science behind it what's the psychology behind it you know in this life you will find it is a is constant this expectations what is going to happen to me tomorrow this botheration is keeping me focused in the present just take an example that in the morning when the house when the mother is busy preparing food for the child for the husband and she most probably also has to go out for the work how busy she is can she ever think of anything of what has happened yesterday or what is going to happen tomorrow nothing she is totally focused because of that extreme uh, there's immediate uh, all the concerns is keeping them focused now when i'm relaxed then only i can think of the past then only i can think that uh, what my actions is going to result in the future my mind broadens as if when i am uh, so called a bit relaxed so even you will find that now it is those who uh, this uh, take you retrace you to some past life the method i i am not speaking with whether they are genuine or not but if you just even in internet you search there are many such thing the method they uh, adopt is hypnotizing to a relaxed state 
the one who will be taken retreated back to the past life is first asked to be totally relaxed they will be asked to be in a reclining position totally relaxed and then through the suggestions they are taking them to the past so whether it's genuine or not and i'm not speaking of that i'm seeing the method they adopt what that speaks of that your mind should be free from all the immediate concerns which speaks of expectations that tomorrow when i go to the office uh, what's waiting for me uh, all those things are actually speaks of uh, that parigraha because how my what how my boss is going to treat me how my colleagues are going to treat me whether my job will be there or not all those things it's not just that a non acceptance of give reason also speaks of parigraha i'm depending on other when those falls off how it falls off with a total conviction the divine is there to take care of me and then your mind becomes enlarged you that immediate focus has gone that it has enlarged and it now envelops the past and the future so when the is the biases of the mind falls off the mind can also predict correctly the future the two things happen when the sense of immediate immediacy falls off the it it allows the mind to go to the past and however the what of the future the biases has fallen off because of the practice of without expectation there are no biases it is the expectations which create the bias to give an example in a very common example in vedanta what is how the expectation create the bias that there is a stump in the corner of a spark a tree has died the stump is there when it is dark the thief thinks it is the police just see the their expectation the thief is what is he is expecting that i shouldn't be caught by the police so it makes it think it as the police so this just see how biases distort our vision the police who is in search of the thief thinks that stump to be the thief the one who is in, who has went out to the park waiting for the lover to come thinks it to be his lover the child who has play is over now has to return to home and is waiting for the mother to come to take him back to home thinks that to be the mother the mother thinks it to be the child so as per your expectation you create your bias and that distorts your vision so when the bias falls off then your vision becomes something where which is correct which is not filtered so that way you can even predict the future correctly sri ramakrishna gives a wonderful example that is that example so many times we have stated when the two are uh, players are playing chess and the third one is observing you will find the one who is observing always says the correct move and we may have the idea that most probably he is a good player but now just the role changes the one who was observing he starts playing and the one who was playing starts observing and now you will find the one as an observer who was saying the correct move now have started faltering in his moves why it happens the moment you start playing the expectation comes you have now no more aparigraha you are no more established in aparigraha why that i have to win i shouldn't lose the fear of losing the desire for winning has clouded your mind so the most of the mind is actually clouded by because of that it is already engaged with all those expectations you cannot concentrate on the game so they you start faltering your moves the one who is observing has nothing to do with the winning or losing no expectation for the time being as if he is practicing aparigraha and he can tell the correct move but the total mind is focused there so that's how you will find that the one who is established in aparigraha non acceptance and non expectation the knowledge of the past and the future existence dawns in his mind so this is uh, the science behind it and that is something you will find is quite rational it is bound to happen and then the 40th and the 41st now all the yamas has been enunciated that what's the result that is going to follow if you get established in the five yamas like ahimsa uh, satya asteya brahmacharya and aparigraha we discussed till the 39 sutra it has discussed now the 40th and the 41st these two sutras will speak the result which ensues if you get established in shauchya cleanliness 
Why two sutras? Because shaucha doesn't mean only external cleanliness. It, it means both the external cleanliness as well as the internal, the cleanliness of the mind as well as the cleanliness of the so-called the body. So cleanliness of the body, if you are established in the cleanliness of the body, what's the result that has been spoken, spoken of in the 40th Sutra? And if you have cleansed your mind, your mind has become pure, no impurity, shocha means that. If you get established, then that result of that, if you get established in internal purification, the result of that has been uh, enunciated in the 41st Sutra. So let us read the 40th and the 41st Sutra and just try to understand what it is speaking of. Shauchat, the 40th Sutra. Shauchat, Swa Anga Jagupsha Parai Asam Sargaha. If you practice purification, not beautification, there's difference between purification and beautification. When you are beautifying your body, then what happens? Actually, I am trying to make it presentable to others. And that way, what happens? The attraction for the other is natural. The attraction for my own body and for the other is natural. So, shaucha doesn't mean this beautifying with the cosmetics and with the sense. That is not shaucha. Just cleanliness. I keep it clean. If you do that, if you don't use some artificial, what you say, this uh, perfumes, then one thing is one to, if you just try to keep it clean without perfumes and others, you will find by nature, the body is unclean. You cannot keep it clean. It is actually, as we cannot keep it clean, we shadow the so-called, all the bad odors with all that. That's why we use the fragrance. But if you are practicing shocha, cleanliness, the disgust for the body is bound to come. You will no more try to make it presentable to others. And that's how the aversion for this external body develops, which is very, very, which is a very important trait in spiritual evolution. Unless we, are, we have developed to a certain extent detachment for this body, you just open the TV, all the advertisement, 90% of the advertisement is just for this external body. We are so attached to it. All those things falls off. Immediately it falls off. But half of the mind is free. That why this, uh, this tonsor, that, that these monks are, uh, it is prescribed that the monks should shave their head. Because you'll find again that as long as the hair is there, so much time goes in, the, there are so many hairstyles we have heard that in North Korea, they have limited that there shouldn't be more hairstyles than some 30 or 40 or whatever it is. What it speaks of, that there is, there is a huge distraction that how to uh, just uh, groom it, uh, how to dress myself and all those we are wasting our time just for one thing, how I to make myself presentable to the others. So as long as we are identified with our body, we always try to make it presentable to others. So it is the practice of Shocha, we realize that inherent uncleanliness, it is unclean by nature. And then the disgust is developed to come. And then this uh, once endeavor to make it presentable to others vanish, that is Swa Anga Jagupsha. You don't, it's not, doesn't mean that uh, when you say that Aversion for one's body doesn't mean that I don't take care of it. So these words are exact, if, you, if I don't understand it in its proper context, the meaning will be totally, uh, we will miss the meaning. That aversion for one's body doesn't mean that I don't take care of the body. Aversion for one's body means I no more try to make it presentable to others. That is what is the, the real meaning of the word. That swa anga jagupsha. I of course still continue to make it, keep it clean. But that constant, that endeavor, that it should be made presentable to others, that falls off. And parai asam sargaha. When I am so much convinced about this uncleanness of my body, this all the so-called, the external beauty which we see in others is actually just a package. A very wonderful package, nicely perfumed. And you 
really like the package but when you open it it is full of filth if you knew, if you knew that that package is actually full of filth would you have ever touched it in spite of the fact that package is so nice it is so nicely perfumed i would have never touched it as i don't know what it is or as i am not aware what it is i feel it to be something attracting and that's what our physical body is once you develop the disgust for your own body because of its uncleanliness that the sadhaka develops that detachment for others body also it no more attracts him and that's the great uh, the spiritual benefit which you get out of it then does it mean that that person is no more uh, loving towards others no it's actually the sensuousness has fallen off the real love develops when that sensuousness has fallen off you find that real friendliness compassion is emanating from such person so many persons are there when this they are just uh, listen to the holy mother's life they feel that ramakrishna have not done proper justice because with our impure mind we judge that character we can never imagine that how wonderfully there is there's a mutual love which had nothing to do with the sensuousness and that love we even we cannot imagine how they had that wonderful love because they were established in shocha they were established in shocha neither they had the attraction for their own body nor for others body their all interpersonal relationship was in the level of the spirit so the real love the word love we have totally tarnished we don't know the meaning of the love the real love is possible only when we have developed this aversion for this physical existence for the, for the physic that we exist most of our life in our mind through in our spirit that's our real existence when the more we can relate to that the more we are established in shocha so that's the thing which has been spoken of in the 40th sutra the 41st sutra speaks of the internal purification when you get established when your mind gets pure no more the negative thoughts uh, no more uh, impulses no more um, sensuous thoughts are there to distract you then what's the result we will just read uh, the sutra and just have uh, just try to understand its literal meaning and we'll go to the description the time is almost over we will go to its uh, inner meaning uh, in the next class so what is the 41st sutra speaking satva shuddhi sau manasya ekagra indriya jaya atman darshana yog yog yogyatva when you have internal purification first thing that happens is other various things which follows one after that first comes the sattva suddhi purification of sattva what it means we will again uh, describe it in the next class we will uh, enunciate elaborate on it in the next class just uh, first let us try to understand the list of things that are going to happen when we get established in the purification of the mind there's a purification of the sattva so manasya cheerfulness of the mind comes you will find your mind is always cheerful when you are pure when you can really have that internal purification when your mind is pure it is always cheerful it's a total wrong belief that when we are uh, having the sensuous pursuit and when we reach the goal of our sensuous pursuit or pursuit we have happiness that happiness is 1/16th in the scripture they say of the happiness when you can get rid of the all the so called sensuousness and keep the mind pure that has been spoken of as so manasya the tranquility of the mind the cheerfulness of the mind that follows after the sattva so the purification of the sattva what purification of sattva means we will take up again in the next class once you have that so manasya your mind is cheerful relaxed now you know what focus is ekagra the mind now develops that focus and once it develops the focus it becomes very easy to get rid of the impulses of your senses indriya jaya you senses automatically get subjugated in this life you will find even uh, the some some of the scientists uh, when they have been interviewed they when they have been asked that what about your so called these little pleasures of life this is no time they're so focused in theirs 
uh, this scientific research, the other things has fallen off automatically. So when your mind becomes ekagra, the mind at a time cannot have two pursuits. If it is so concentrated that it is always focused in something higher, the other things are bound to fall off. And that's how the Indriya Jaya happens. You subjugate your senses. It is not something negative that I'm forcefully subjugating them. The more you go towards the East, the West automatically falls behind. So that's through that Ekagrata, the Indriya Jaya ensues. And not only that, in the long run, this Ekagrata at the very beginning helps you to get rid of the so-called, the impulse of the sense, the sense gets subjugated. And in the long run, it makes you eligible, capable for realizing your own self, Atma Darshana Yogyatva. So these are the various results that ensues if you get established in internal purification. So it needs a bit more elaboration. We will again take up in the next class to elaborate on this 41st Sutra. So with this, we conclude our class today. Thank you all. Namaskar.